Okay, welcome everyone. We still have um, several people joining us. Um, good morning or hello from wherever you're joining us. Um, welcome to Understanding the War in Ukraine, a panel for, uh, with SFU experts. Um, this event is hosted by SFU Public Square and FS, uh, SFU School for International Studies. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Megan McKenzie, and I am the Simons Chair in International Law and Human Security at Simon Fraser University. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking today from the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. I also acknowledge uh, my responsibilities as a settler in the ongoing process of truth, reconciliation, and decolonization. So again, welcome. I, I am moderating this event and I'd just like to start with a few um, housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, first, this event, uh, there's closed captioning for this event. Um, you can access by pressing the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If at any point you need technical assistance, you can reach um, our team through the chat. Um, so thank you to our captioners um, who are using uh, accurate, uh, at accurate real time for providing this service. So again, if you have any tech issues, send a message to um, anyone with SFU Public Square in their Zoom name and they'll help you out. I also want to acknowledge that uh, and, and let you know that this event is being recorded and will be made available on SFU's Public Square's uh, website. Um, and YouTube channel. So feel free to share that later. Um, for our Q&A at the end of this event or at the uh, last portion of this event, we'll be taking questions using Slido. So this is a website. Um, we've had many questions already, but if you have some questions during the event, you can access this on your phone or computer. You just have to go to Slido. Um, in your web browser and enter the six digit code just here, the 151025. Um, so you can submit your questions at any point during the event. Um, and you can also upvote other people's questions. So if you see a question on Slido that um, you wanna hear answered, you can upvote that. And at the end, we'll, I will be moderating the Q&A. So we'll do our best to um, bring in some of those questions. Um, so thank you at, um, to everyone who's already uh, been submit, submitting questions in advance. Um, just another note before we get started around community, community guidelines. Um, I'd like to remind you of the community guidelines for this event that are posted in the chat box. So really overall, um, there'll be zero tolerance for those who promote violence or discrimination against others on the basis of race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, religious affiliation, age or disability. Um, so anyone who incites harm towards other participants will be removed at the discretion of the event uh, host. Um, and then just moving to the format, just so you know what to expect, um, each of our five panelists will give a short, um, approximately five minute presentation on their topic of expertise. And then for the final uh, around 30 to, to 45 minutes, we'll have a Q&A again, where we'll take some of your questions from Slido and I will pose some questions as well. So thank you for getting through all of those. Uh, we have a really important packed event and I wanna make sure it goes as smoothly as possible. So those are just the technical elements. Um, now I'd like to welcome Nicole Jackson, um, Associate Professor and Chair of Graduate Studies at SFU's School for International Studies. Um, and she's gonna provide a bit of context um, and a context setting for this event. Okay, hello. Thank you very much, Megan. And thank you to SFU uh, Public Dialogue for helping to organize this event. I'd like to especially thank the audience for taking time out of your busy lives to join us today. So for over a month now, we've been witnessing extraordinary tragedies, atrocities, crimes against humanity, resulting from Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. This war began in 2014, 
but of course it has an even longer historical context. It is devastating on a human level. It also has significant and still unknown implications for peoples, for states, for regions, for trade, for alliances, and yes, for the world order. We are furthermore on the cusp of a growing intersecting global food, energy, and migration crises, which this war is exacerbating. So in just over a month, a lot seems to have changed. I think it's very difficult in the middle of a war and so much suffering and destruction to have conversations about it. There are also many uncertainties about what will happen, what can, and what should be done. And I think this all should be acknowledged, but it's also important to make space to talk, to share, to document, and especially to listen and to learn and to keep alive a belief in a better world. On this occasion, we are adding the voices of some of the SFU scholars who care, who want to help sh shed light um, or contest, to context to ask hard questions about what is happening and the many implications of such a devastating war and to think through our actions and non-actions in response. I am honestly so very proud to have these voices as my colleagues one of whom is joining us today from Ukraine. So in this session, you will hear about some of the many, many aspects of this war, historical and current, the role of geopolitics, of cyber, of narratives and information, of international and humanitarian actors, and peoples living through the war and trying to escape to safety. While wars have so many horrific realities and negative implications, People are also capable of great resilience and hope. And ultimately, I hope we can trigger and contribute to conversations about what those of us in education, we at SFU, scholars, staff, students, along with others within our societies can do in a myriad of ways to make a more positive contribution to this world. Okay, so I will now hand back the floor to my colleague, Megan McKenzie. Thanks so much, Nicole, for setting the scene so well. And, and also for, um, I think that important point around how difficult it is to um, make comments and to have conversations as the war is unfolding and how that presents a particular challenge, but how important it is that we um, learn and bring together experts in this way. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to welcome our first presenter for today, um, Ilya Vetkovinsky, um, an associate professor in SFU's Department of History. So thank you, Ilya. Hello, uh, it's very good to be here. Uh, and I'm very happy to be part of this forum. Uh, I do not have an awful lot to say about 19th century Russian history and colonial practices and their influence on today's war, because uh, although there are many connections, uh, they all of them would fail to uh, do justice to this in a, a short time. I will briefly say that I highly recommend everyone uh, who wants, is interested in these connections to read uh, Leo Tolstoy's Haji Murat, which is also in the chat. Uh, uh, this is just a very brief book as opposed to Leo Tolstoy's classics like Anna Karenina and War and Peace. And yet, I think if you read it, especially the, you can read it in one day, 100 pages, uh, the, 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 especially the descriptions of uh, Nicholas I uh, by Leo Tolstoy, uh, you will see some connections to today's events uh, and many other things in that book, great book. So uh, I just would like to emphasize that. Uh, apart from that, I would also like to, the one thing I would like to say, uh, of course, I am no expert on Ukraine itself. Uh, my specialty is on 19th century Russian history, but I do want to convey one message if I, if I can, and not from the perspective of a, being an expert, but just as a human being. Uh, I just want you to know that contrary to a lot of the perceptions that you hear uh, the, in Russia, and of course, this is a completely separate thing that's going on from Ukraine, uh, Russians are deeply, deeply divided uh, by this conflict. There is no one voice. It's very difficult to characterize the Russian reaction uh, in a simple way. Um, everyone I know in Russia uh, is 
seems very traumatized by this event in one way or another. Uh, and, uh, and, it's a, and it's not a simple, um, there's no simple answer to their, uh, to their reaction. The, you know, it used to be that Russians would uh, have a lot of jokes going around in other times. The only, right now, there's, there's not a time for humor, but the one joke that one hears uh, these days is, remember the good old days of COVID, how great they were, uh, which sort of tells you the anxiety that underlies the current uh, very strange times in both Russia and Ukraine and the world. Uh, thank you. With that in mind, I will passing the baton. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilya. Um, so next, I'd like to invite back Nicole Jackson, um, Associate Professor and Chair of Graduate Studies in the School for International Studies to bring in her, her fulsome comments. You just have to unmute, Nicole. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you again, Megan and Ilya for those comments. Um, I now am going to address a question related to my own research that I am probably most frequently at, asked, and that is how does today's war compare to um, Russian Federation's use of militaries in other wars in the former Soviet space after 1991? And then I might give a few thoughts about what today's war means for Russia in the former Soviet space moving forward. So Russia's invasion this February 24th, as I um, mentioned earlier, is a continuation of the war that began in 2014. And it is certainly distinctive in many ways in terms of scale, for example, which we have over um, 4.4 million refugees and over 8 million people displaced. We have extraordinary atrocities and crimes against humanities and flattening of cities, which in a sense makes it more of like um, cases within technically the Russian Federation in Chechnya or outside of the former Soviet space in Syria. Um, maybe now, especially now that we have General Volnikov, who's um, commanded in both areas now in charge. But if we look over the past 30 years, so with the breakup of the Soviet Union right, in 1991, if we look over the past 30 years in the former Soviet Union, we can see trends that are rooted in Russia's legacy of empire that I think add some insight into Russia's military actions over time and up until today. So after the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, Russia was involved in what I've called the first generation of Russian wars. These are in Moldova, in Georgia, and in Tajikistan in the 1990s. And in those cases, it used comparatively limited military action to force what were then newly independent states to become closer to, to Moscow. And in doing so, it gained, okay, the regime, the Russian regime gained control of separatist areas in the case of Moldova and Georgia. It fought on their behalf. It ended up in all these cases being part of negotiating peace and installing so-called Russian peacekeepers and military bases in those countries. And basically it forced the countries to join or to continue within Russian led organizations, economic security to sign other treaties and so on. And I was in Russia at the time in the 1990s. I was a young student and I was following all of the debate. There was a lot of debate over what Russia should and should not do in terms of options. And overall, the West paid no attention. This was seen as Russia's near abroad. Second generation of Russia's wars, which I'm calling them, occurred in 2000. And by now, President Putin is in power. And you all know that these are the real precursors to today's war. So I'm thinking here of Russia-Georgian war in 2008, and when Russia actually annexed Crimea and military occupied Donetsk and Luhansk in 2014. So compared to the 1990s, obviously domestic politics, geopolitics very different. This is an increasingly right, authoritarian state, it's increasingly squashing any kind of debate. And the Russian state perceived increasingly so that Georgia and Ukraine moving further towards the West is a greater threat. 
And by that, I mean the state perceived pro-Western leaderships, what it saw as developing ties with NATO and the EU, um, as pulling these countries out of Russian orbit and out of Russian-led alliances. Meanwhile, of course, on the flip side, we all know that more and more Ukrainians and Georgian and others wanted to have their own freedom to decide their own future, right, and to develop their own national identities. And in these years, in the 2000s, you know, the West starts paying a lot more attention. But my point here is that similar to the 1990s, Russia acted to destabilize, to take over and control areas in order to influence countries to pull them back towards Russia. So in sum, there's a clear trend of Russia using more and more violence, but also among other tactics, of course, and more and more disinformation we're gonna hear about later, um, mercenaries and so on, to secure territory in other countries in order to tie them closer to Russia. And at the same time, we see the end of debate over options or open debate over options. So the 2022 war then is a culmination of this trend in which Russia drops the strategy of limited war to achieve its aims. And I think that this extreme violence that we see is going to make it harder than in the 1990s to negotiate. And as we look towards peace, Remember that Russia in the past has always insisted on controlling negotiations, on occupying territory with its peacekeepers, even as it has you know, welcomed eventually international actors. So very briefly then, what does this current war mean for Russia and the former Soviet space today? Well, former Soviet Union is diverse, right? The region is diverse. Um, we're talking about 50 in different countries, okay? And it's in flux. So Russia's involvement in the region will depend, I think, on the evolution of economic factors. So how the economic sanctions and breakdown of trade now will affect Russian politics and economics, and that in turn will affect other countries. Central Asian states, for example, you know, some of them in particular are very dependent on Russian remittances and trades. Prices already are going up. Extreme hunger is on the rise in, in nearby Afghanistan and so on. Number two, Russia will have to navigate increasing, if varying, degree of alarm about Russia's actions and intentions. Um, in many countries, the publics right, are pushing their leaderships to take a more Ukrainian, uh, pro-Ukrainian stance. They're out on the streets asking for this. The regime, some of them quite authoritarian, are also worried about these popular protests. And they're trying to also think through how to deal with an increased number of refugees, of even Russian migrants leaving um, Russia, um, what to do with mercenaries and so on. Number three, I think the area to watch um, or areas to watch are what Putin decides to do and can do about Russia's military stationed in the other so-called frozen conflicts. Okay, so those are the ones where I told you back in the 1990s, Russia kind of gained control in Georgia and in Moldova. And Russia still has, you know, control over sections of these in Abkhazia and Transnistria. Yet the larger countries are looking still towards the European Union, right, even more so in some cases. So what happens there will be interesting to follow. Russia also has peacekeepers, right, with nagorno karabakh and Azerbaijan. Russia also has military bases in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Um, and finally, I think that Russia's war, you know, may strengthen pro-regional Russian alignments, but that's, you know, that's to be seen also. And here I'm thinking about the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is Putin's most significant effort at creating or developing a regional security organization, which was recently used um, just before the Ukraine war to, to, to kind of go in and quell protests in Kazakhstan. And I'm also thinking about the consolidation and disillusion um, we might see of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is another trans-regional organization that links Russia and China for the Central Asian states, and now Pakistan and India with Iran, you know, trying to join. So, you know, to put it very simply, the region is in flux. Russia will probably try to increase you know, develop increasingly develop its military and security ties in much of uh, the former Soviet space. And of course, this is largely dependent on unknown economic factors and also what happens on the ground next in Ukraine. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you so much for putting the current events in a broader history of violence and the use of violence by Russia and also highlighting some of the potential implications. Thank you so much. Um, now we have um, Svetlana Matvienko, um, an assistant professor of critical media analysis in the School for Communication. We're very, very grateful um, Svetlana could join us from Ukraine where she's been teaching remotely um, and keeping a war diary of her experience called Dispatch Dispatches on the Place of Imminence. Um, you can read on the Institute of Network Cultures, uh, Cultures website, and I believe we have links um, in the chat as well. So thank you so much for your time, which I know is very precious right now. Um, and please go ahead. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. And I also want to thank Nicole for setting the, con the context for this conversation so well. And just to what she said, I also want to, again, make another emphasis on the particular importance of uh, placing our attention on imperial and colonial aspect of this current situation. And myself, I've been always saying that I feel myself, especially recently, I feel myself particularly responsible that before all these years, I was focusing on all different realms and never kind of uh, immersed myself into thinking, into developing a new vocabulary uh, for addressing these historical uh, issues uh, in this realm, in the realm of former Soviet Union or the realm of former Soviet influence. Because uh, there are some, like, uh, we are very well familiar with colonial uh, and imperial uh, criticism, but it doesn't fit entirely to that realm. And in a certain way, in order to address certain problems, we need this vocabulary, but we cannot use the existing vocabulary. And so many of us today who started writing about colonial and imperial context that are in play in this war really realize this problem. And um, that's, I definitely see a task for myself for the future. I also want to mention uh, a saying uh, um, that belongs to former Czech uh, Republic President Václav Gavel when he tried to de describe the particular type of Russian imperialism. And he said a kind of quite an interesting thing. He said that as a problem with Russian empire that it does not know where it begins and where it ends. And this is incredibly important because if this country doesn't know this, nobody else does. And what we have with this incredibly awkward statements coming from uh, the head of Russian state and the propagandists and any other supporters, they are all questioning some um, assumption and they're able to produce like incredibly strange uh, statements like Ukraine doesn't exist or it does have, it has no history or Ukraine was created by Lenin, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting that these kind of awkward things still resonate with some audiences. That was always strange to me and I will talk a little more about this by the end of my short presentation when I speak about disinformation and how these statements feed into this uh, broad disinformation campaign. But now I want to say a couple of words about the topic which is the center of my research, which is cyber war. And I understand cyber war in not in an old fashioned way where it is seen as something just belonging to the realm of the digital, but actually something that occurs on the nexus, on the intersection of the digital and kinetic. Specifically in a way how our life today is all augmented and is a mix of digital communication, actual communication, caring technology, certain transparency, surveillance, and 
of course, powerful information flows that impact how we act and think or do not act or stop thinking, right? So it's very complex and that's precisely uh, what we see in unfolding in this, in this war. And here in this war, this combination of the digital and physical or the kinetic comes to the extent that we've never seen before. And of course, we have some completely outdated technologies, but we also see the high level of AI technologies engaged in the action. And it would be even enough to mention drones, right? So it's a drone war in a certain way. We see drones here everywhere. Drones are reading uh, the territory. Drones are used for strikes. And they became such a kind of uh, the dimension of our reality here that I wouldn't even believe before. So all we talk here is about drones. We are seeing drones everywhere. We are reporting drones. We are afraid of drones. Drones means that the strike is coming and so on. And they penetrated our life to the extent that it's quite unbelievable. So, <clears throat> uh, these uh, are kind of like quite important aspects of what's happening. But I want to talk more about um, what I'm always asked about is um, disinformation. And whenever I'm invited to talk about disinformation and I'm asked questions, usually I see that uh, people expect to hear with this most recent framework. So what about disinformation within last months? What kind of uh, fakes did you see, I'm asked? Or what kind of lies did you hear? But I'm always saying that it's, uh, disinformation is much broader than it is imagined, than, it is, uh, than what we see through fakes or lies, right? And here, I'm saying that disinformation uh, could be strategic and tactical. And what we've seen through the last 20 years, long, very long, and very much, very well-structured campaigns, uh, one example would be uh, the work of Russia today and how it was working with the Western audiences. I think that's where uh, we should pay more attention today when we speak about disinformation. Because in order for a little fake or a lie to be effective, you need to prepare the audiences. You need to prepare um, them to accept whatever lie or whatever fake they receive. And what Russia today uh, was doing <clears throat> was incredibly smart and incredibly sophisticated. And so when, when it is dropped from broadcast like two weeks ago, it means nothing. It's literally a symbolic gesture because all work it had to do is done. And this work is about creating Western audiences who would trust it. And some discourses of Russia today, we should admit, looked like progressive, critical, etc. They really resonated with Western progressive audiences. And that's how they started listening to Russia today. But we also should understand that the only ideology that this um, channel, and it's just one of the examples, the only ideology it has is basically power and money. And in a certain way, all this criticism that was produced by this channel uh, was not original take of theirs, but the simulation of what was already discussed, what was already said by Western progressive audiences. And that's how it works. It takes, it basically steals ideas from the audiences, repackages them and sends them back. And when audiences hear what they already believe, they think this medium is to trust. And that's what has been done for a very long time. 
right? So it's no ideology, it's blank. It doesn't produce any criticism. It doesn't care for anything. It cares to get you. And that's how I was amazed in terms of, uh, you know, like this extensive and quite successful work that has been done. And then after this, when you already have your, your audiences that trust you, you can manipulate opinions. You can kind of throw in little things. You can amplify your myth of Ukrainian Nazis or something else. And somehow, you know, it resonates, at least to a certain extent. At least it creates a doubt, if not complete trust, right? And that was uh, what has been happening for a very, very long time. And I'm also with some sadness, just fine uh, final thoughts, uh, thought here. With some sadness, I must uh, add that um, the lack of attention to certain Ukrainian issues, cultural issues, etc., was also a problem, right? So it didn't uh, exist in kind of the art scene. We were always given a niche shared with Russia. And we're saying like, this is your niche. You are like them, right? So it was constantly, we were pushed in some space where we do not have any recognition. All sort of moments and problems with cultural appropriation also uh, are related to this. And in a certain way, it's so easy for many to believe that Ukraine doesn't exist, or it's just the same as Russia, or it's just a strange country with some crazy nationalist problem, right? So that sometimes you feel like it takes so much energy of you to defend yourself that sometimes you don't do this. And I haven't been doing this. And I feel extremely guilty that I didn't contribute, that I didn't do something maybe some 20 years or 10 years ago. And now I have to. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana. That was so insightful and so helpful. And I, I really appreciate especially the, the way you talked about disinformation and how it's not just about lies or fakes, that this the whole creation of an audience that is receptive to disinformation is, is, is a, an important part of the um, puzzle. And thank you so much. Um, I'll look forward to hearing more in the question and answer as well. Um, so next, um, please welcome Paul Meyer. He's a fellow in international security and a colleague of mine, an adjunct professor in the School for International Studies. He's also had a 35 year career with the Canadian Foreign Service with a specialization um, in international security policy. So um, please go ahead, Paul. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Megan. Uh, I would like uh, in the brief time I have to describe how three international organizations have responded to Russia's aggression against Ukraine. The three intergovernmental organizations are the United Nations with 193 member states, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, a collective defense alliance with 30 members, and uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, a regional uh, security organization with 57 member states, all the European states plus the United States and Canada. The United Nations, of course, was created in 1945 primarily to maintain international peace and security and prevent war, the carnage of which the founding states had just emerged from. The UN body for uh, responsible for maintaining uh, peace and security is the Security Council with its 15 members, five permanent members and 10 rotational elected members. A key feature of the Security Council was that the five permanent members had veto privileges, i.e. any one of them could prevent action by the council if they opposed it. While the five permanent members were the major victorious allies, and it was not seen at the time as feasible for the UN to act if these five were not in agreement, this discriminatory feature has long been viewed as a weakness of the system. This weakness was much in evidence 
with Russia's veto on February 25th of a Security Council resolution condemning its aggression against Ukraine. Despite that resolution being supported by 11 members of the council with three abstaining. Fortunately, the UN General Assembly moved quickly on March the 2nd under a rarely used Uniting for Peace provision to adopt a resolution condemning the aggression, a resolution which was adopted with 141 yes votes. This was uh, in some ways a symbolic victory as General Assembly resolutions are not legally binding on member states and lack the enforcement powers of Security Council resolutions. A similar symbolic move uh, was the General Assembly resolution adopted April 7th that expelled Russia from the 47 member UN Human Rights Council. The only other example of such a removal of a Human Rights Council member was that of Libya expelled in 2011. There has also been action by the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. Again, largely of a symbolic nature, given that neither Russia nor Ukraine are party to the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice relies on the Security Council to enforce its rulings which takes us back to that primordial problem of the veto. NATO has responded to Russia's aggression by roundly condemning it and taking measures to boost its defense capacities on its eastern flank. NATO has also supported the provision of military aid to Ukraine by various of its members, while insisting that it will not directly confront Russian forces. In the words of President Biden, I will not start World War III over Ukraine. NATO has, however, been re-energized by the Russian action, with new commitments being made by its members, and even long-time neutral states like Sweden and Finland now musing about applying for NATO membership. As NATO's Secretary General Stoltenberg has remarked, Putin wanted less NATO on its borders. He will now be getting more NATO due to Russia's actions. Finally, I turn to the OSCE, which has had the most direct of underappreciated role with respect to the crisis Russia has created in Ukraine. We must recall that the current invasion of Ukraine was preceded in 2014 by Russia's annexation of Crimea and its support to pro-Russian separatist forces in the region of Eastern Ukraine known as the Donbass. The OSCE uh, with Germany and France in the lead was the diplomatic vehicle for conclusions of agreements known as Minsk I and Minsk II concluded between Russia and Ukraine in 2014-2015 respectively. These agreements yield a shaky ceasefire and elements of a broader peace deal that envisaged some autonomy for the separatist statelets in Luhansk and Donetsk in return for the central government regaining control of its borders and the withdrawal of foreign forces. Implementation of these agreements has been stymied by disputes over the sequencing and nature of the commitments made in them. Although the OSCE deployed a major monitoring mission with some 700 unarmed observers generating daily reports on violations of the agreements, these ultimately uh, were unable to prevent an upsurge of violence and the entire mission was withdrawn at the time of the Russian invasion. If and when a negotiated settlement is arrived at to terminate the war in Ukraine, we can anticipate that the OSCE will once again be involved with its implementation. This uh, rapid review serves to demonstrate how difficult it is within our existing international structures to hold a sovereign state to account for its wrongful actions especially a permanent member of the Security Council, if that state denies responsibility and refuses to cooperate. 
I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Paul, for um, providing that context of the um, international and re regional organizations. And as someone who just finished teaching um, uh, Introduction to International Studies, where we talked about all of the different international organizations, and, and, and it really was sort of getting to that similar conclusion that it, it still provides, proves very difficult to hold a sovereign state accountable if they are um, in denial of their actions. So thank you for, for for your presentation. Um, so our final presenter today is James Horncastle. He's assistant professor um, in the SFU Department of Humanities and the Edward and Emily McWinney Professor in International Relations. So thank you, James, for joining us. And thank you for the warm welcome, Megan. So the images of refugees fleeing war ravaged Ukraine rightfully created an emotional resonance amongst people throughout the world. As of yesterday, approximately 4.6 million people have fled Ukraine, and at least 7.1 million have been displaced internally within the country. In some, over one quarter of Ukraine's population have fled their homes. Amongst this number, approximately one half of the children in Ukraine have been displaced by the war. Politicians and academics typically treat refugees and displaced peoples as a byproduct of war. In the case of Ukraine, however, is becoming increasingly clear that the Russian army is manufacturing refugees as it pursues its objectives in the region. The use of refugees to pressure an opponent is not a new tactic. In fact, Russia's close ally, Belarus, has at several points in the past and an ongoing case in the present, sought to use the threat of migrants to pressure the European Union to change its policies. The Russian army's initial shock and awe tactics seem to, uh, likely to have had this desired effect as non-military targets were frequently hit in the initial stages. While some analysts have claimed that this is due to the inaccuracy of Russian artillery and missiles, the scale of it points to other calculations. That said, while the Russian army is manufacturing the refugee crisis with its tactics, it appears to have severely miscalculated the European Union's response to refugees. Putin banked on the refugee wave being received by the European Union, like the Syrian refugees in 2015. The response of the European Union, however, has been the exact opposite, with European countries providing for the refugees, while simultaneously the displaced peoples have served as a rallying cry for Europe and the world that something needs to be done on the issue. That said, the long-term effects of the strategy are very much in play, if recent divisions within the EU over migrant policy are any indication, and thus Russia's strategy of using refugees to pressure European policymakers may yet bear fruit. Unfortunately, the evolving nature of the war is only going to make the human rights abuses more prevalent in the crisis and exasperate the refugee crisis in Ukraine. Russia has both changed its objectives in the country, focusing more on acquiring territory in the east and southeast, as well as change this chain of command. In the case of the latter, Putin placed General Dvornikov in charge of the forces in Ukraine. Dvornikov previously served in Syria, assisting Bashir al-Assad's forces in the ongoing Syrian civil war. Russian forces under his command were known for committing extensive human rights abuses and helped train the Syrian army in similar tactics. His appointment presages similar tactics in Ukraine. As the Russian army switches its focus to acquiring territory in eastern Ukraine, with increasingly transparent efforts to break away these territories from the Ukrainian state, the issue arises of what Russia does with the population of these territories. We already have some indication with regards to Putin's plans for the region. First, Russia's sieges of cities like Mariupol will further add to the refugee crisis facing Ukraine and Europe. The complete destruction of Mariupol as a city will limit arguments by its population to return, knowing they can never return to their previous lives. Furthermore, when the people eventually leave the city, it will increase the logistical burden upon Ukraine and Europe as they're forced to care for these people after this severely traumatic event. Second, it is clear that the Russian army is deliberately depopulating the region in an effort to forward its arguments about the Eastern territory's Russian nature. There are now credible reports that Russia is taking people from the Donbass and send them to Russia, first to filtration camps, as they've been called, and then elsewhere in the country. The current scale of such operations are unknown, 
but speak to the population engineering that Russia is conducting on territories that is occupied. Putin, in short, not only created a refugee crisis through invading Ukraine, but is actively facilitating it. By understanding that this is part of Russian strategy for Ukraine, we can simultaneously better understand their motives as they seek to use a humanitarian tragedy to further their agenda, as well as increase preparations for refugees that will be fleeing the conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Thanks for your great comments and focusing um, specifically on refugees and displaced people in particular. I thought that was a really important um, focus. Um, so thank you again for all of our panelists um, for such a great discussion um, and to the team at SFU Public Square for partnering with the School for International Studies on this event and um, to Accurate Real Time for providing the captioning. So thank you all for joining us. I don't know if you can see, but there's been uh, upwards of 300 people joining us today. So I know there's great interest um, in this topic. So we're going to move to the um, Q&A. So I think maybe all of our participants could turn their video on now. Um, and I, I wanted to sort of start with a question uh, to all of the panelists um, and maybe particularly Svetlana, you could, you could start us off. I think I wanna go back to um, in some ways what Nicole started us off with was setting the scene and how it's in some ways difficult to make reflections and to make sense of something as it's ongoing. You know, this is, this is a conflict that is happening as we speak and, and, and things are changing. We're learning information every day. And so I'm curious about, um, given that this is an ongoing conflict and um, that we have access to highly sensitive and difficult um, information that's very personal, it's very um, uh, difficult to make sense of, it's, it's uh, emotional, it's tragic, it's, it's uh, frustrating, it's, you know, it causes all kinds of emotions. I'm wondering how you're managing um, to make sense of it and continue to do the work that you're doing. Um, for each of the panelists, it's a very different kind of question. Um, and the second part of that question, but it does relate to this ongoing aspect and, and the sensitive nature, is uh, a question that I think maybe many of our panelists might have in their minds, um, is whether you have any advice for those who are joining us who are struggling to know how to stay engaged or to be accountable to keep up on the information, but also that this is an endless, uh, you know, it's a very difficult to sort of balance that with um, being considerate of, of, of what's, a, what's possible in terms of, um, uh, responsible engagement and also self-care, right? what, you know, whatever that term means, but also that there's sort of um, limits to how much we can, we can consume without being overwhelmed. And I see that with my students in particular. Um, so that's a two-part question I realize. And so feel free to take uh, a, 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 an answer at any part of it that resonates with you. Um, but Svetlana, I'd be really interested in, in hearing your response to start us out. Uh, thank you, Megan. Yeah, um, as many of you probably, and many other people, I did not expect this war to happen. I thought it would be this continuous escalation, maybe until unseen kind of buildup of and exposure of power. I was very curious where it's actually going to stop. That was my question a month and a half ago, but I didn't, I didn't see it even being here. And even before the war, already in January, uh, I started feeling ongoing militarization of everything. So people talk about bomb shelters, uh, we were given some ideas or directions about how to compose your emergency backpacks, what kind of meds should be there, how you should think about some basements in your house, whether you should join or not uh, local uh, defense groups. And everything was, you know, like with all my knowledge about military disinformation, militarization of everything, it looked 
com like a complete paranoia. And I felt I, I had the moments where I would start buying those things and putting them in my virtual basket and never make any purchase. I have like all sorts of baskets until now on different websites where I have some backpacks or some meds or some else and else and they exist as virtual. And it's all because I think inside myself, I was really resisting and was very upset by what I saw as militarization of everyday life. And I saw the nuances of that. And that's why I started a diary. I decided I would very critically document this falling into paranoia of militarization. And that's how it began. And believe it or not, where I am now, the thought of going to the army comes more and more often. It might be another phantasmatic response of me being immersed here, but that's what it does to you. And when some, I hear some people are concerned now of whether of, and how to support Ukraine now, I really feel like it's just about my life. It's, it's about whether I come back to Canada or I'm dead in two weeks. And especially with everything that is happening about this um, upcoming scenario of potential victory that has to be designed somehow, but May 9th, it really, you know, now I actually think that something terrible may happen in a week or maybe two weeks. And I don't know how broad it would be and what's actually going to happen to us. So that's uh, in terms of um, the sense of life and how it changed with someone like me being against everything military, even on the level of discourse, even on the level of some daily sensations, etc. Uh, but I started with my way of coping with this was narrativizing because of course, multiple information flows were coming. And I decided I'm just gonna write about this. And with me putting everything in words in this short diary entries was my way of coping with this intense um, and very conflicting uh, and mixed types of information. So I'm still doing this. I'm still coping with that in this way by keeping this diary. But one very practical thing that I think is useful, whether you are in the middle of the war or not, is to take your distance. You know, those information flow are incredibly fast. And they, uh, if, if they consume you, you're completely lost there. You are completely falling into conspiracy theory. You want to make sense of everything and connect what cannot be connected. You start making sense, which is already uh, nonsense. And so that's why my very technical kind of way, I just follow a very limited number of channels, some of them official, some of them come semi-official, some of them, some kind of groups that I know. And I filter the information very much. And then I step up back and write about this. And this writing is an incredible technique of actually dealing with that. Thank you so much, Svetlana. That's so interesting. And just in case anyone hasn't seen in the chat, um, the link for Svetlana's war um, diary is there. And I really encourage you to engage with that. I don't know if anyone, any of the other panelists um, want to reflect on the question posed or, or um, we can certainly move this, this endless number of questions. We won't be able to get to all of them, but um, yeah, go ahead, Nicole. I, well, uh, I mean, I, first of all, I thank again Svetlana for, for her honesty and um, telling us how, how she's, she's coping and how she's thinking about this, this horrible war. I mean, I find it right, as a privileged professor here in Vancouver, 
um, who's done a lot of work on Russian foreign policy, very difficult also, right? How to respond as a scholar and how to respond as a human being. So, I mean, I try to, right, again, as I began, put it in the context that I know of, that I've done research in, and that's kind of looking at it, it in a historical way and in a comparative way and try to look at what's you know similar that we can tell and what, what's changed over the last 30 years. Um, I've been particularly interested in kind of domestic politics and ideas and debates and how that relates to different cases of Russia's involvement, right, in the kind of former Soviet space. And it's different in different cases. And you have to look also at limits of Russia's involvement. And so I think that's, you know, when I put myself in my own kind of where I come from, I watched the Soviet Union break up when I was a young student. And that's still kind of the context in which um, I, I tend to kind of revert when I look at Russia's various meddlings and interferences and acts of wars and disinformation um, and narratives as Svetlana is talking about. And, um, and so I see that as, as my work and what I've been interested in. Um, I, I agree, right, that, I mean, everybody's different. You need to be aware of your own limits when you're kind of listening to, to, to this, um, to this news and when you, you see these images, which are absolutely um, heartbreaking, I find it just on a very personal level now for myself as somebody who works on Russia, sometimes very difficult, right? When I'm talking about the Russian state and how it perceives, I don't know, NATO expansion, for example, that I'm people very clearly understand that I'm not justifying what Russia's done or not done, that I'm talking about how the state has, or elements of the state have, you know, perceived officially, whatever, NATO's expansion over a period of time. So I think generally what I try to do is step out also and try to see how can I, you know, how, how can I be of help, right? And as a professor that might be talking um, to people about what's going on and listening to a whole range of voices to pick up what Ilya said, that there's a whole range of voices. And we see that in SFU students, right? We have students from, Ukraine from East European diasporas here. We have Russian students and they all have, they all have different voices. We have students who are um, going off to, to work in Canadian military, right? In Latvia right now and in Eastern Europe, we have um, students coming back from working in the OSCE and so on. So I think, you know, um, engaging with them, listening to a range of voices, knowing your limits and, and taking a break when you need to probably helpful. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, just building on that, I mean, I think, you know, we have to be cautious in the Canadian context. I mean, we have uh, many among us who uh, themselves were re refugees from conflict, and we don't want to avoid that triggering uh, the tra traumas from the past. Um, I would also, you know, suggest uh, that in addition to the you know the very dark deeds that are being reported on that we also uh, search out the positive stories i mean the remarkable uh, acts of selfish uh, selflessness and volunteer commitments uh, that have been uh, done that speak to the uh, the better angels of our nature so i think that helps uh, in a balancing uh, way. Obviously, there are you know, acts of uh, Amir making the donation to for inter international humanitarian aid uh, can uh, be uh, another uh, positive outlet. And uh, I would say limiting uh, in some ways your intake of the uh, fire hose of, of information and commentary, you know, find a, a couple of reliable sources and uh, rely maybe on the summary of those. Uh, uh, my wife, Judy, uh, first is sitting down uh, in the evening uh, to CBC or BBC. I mean, she says, you know, brace yourselves for the news and, and there's kind of psychological uh, element uh, that uh, com comes in. I think um, uh, these are, are uh, steps that uh, self-protection, if you will, but I think can also uh, allow you to function and, and follow through um, in, a, in a more balanced and and say ma'am. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, we have actually quite a, we have a couple, well, actually quite a few questions that uh, 
focused on NATO. So I wanted to sort of pose, try and find a way to amalgamate some of them, or maybe just ask a general question about, uh, and I think Paul, I'll come to you to begin with, uh, about the role of NATO. And a couple of the questions really ask um, or get to a core question and really around NATO's involvement, the expectations that um, the international community has had of NATO and whether or not um, they've lived up to those expectations and whether um, there's anything that, um, any sort of shifts in the role as, as you see it of the role of NATO in, in light of, of what's happening right now. Well, um... You know, a colleague of ours at the University of Ottawa, Peter Jones, as some of you may know, uh, wrote a blog recently entitled uh, Vladimir Putin, the Savior of NATO. And I think it, it does um, reflect the uh, fact that uh, as a collective defense organization, the threat uh, of, a, of uh, aggression against it, uh, it re-energizes the, the members. And we've seen some of the uh, practical consequences of that. Uh, but I think it, it also uh, shows the, the remaining problem um, we have in terms of the, the nuclear weapons in the world. Um, some of you know, I've been a long time advocate for um, nuclear arms control and disarmament. And you know, here again, I think we can see the um, uh, dangerous uh, elements, the irresponsible uh, nuclear saber rattling that uh, President Putin has engaged in, um, the, but they also the, the, the recognition uh, that this has limited, I think, uh, also uh, the um, in possible engagement of uh, NATO on the side of Ukraine to avoid this direct confrontation and why it's a direct confrontation between NATO uh, military and Russian military is to be avoided is because of the risk that it could escalate to uh, a nuclear exchange. And I think um, that is a factor that uh, we will have to come to grips with uh, going, going forward. Uh, I should also uh, note, because it's often cited, you know, that it was NATO expansion that uh, was the real security threat. I, I tend to see this as a red herring and um, one in which the, the real threat uh, in the eyes of the Kremlin was you had an emerging Western-oriented, uh, populist, uh, uh, growingly democratic uh, regime uh, with uh, signs of uh, prosperity over the longer time. And that was an alternative model to the uh, autocracy, uh, increasingly totalitarian autocracy uh, that's been established in, in Russia. And that was really the problem. Uh, you know, if you are um, believers in uh, the independence of states and then with the collapse of the Soviet Union and its, uh, uh, you know, its uh, empire in the, uh, in the Eastern Soviet bloc, uh, uh, you have to then acknowledge that there's a sovereign right for states to uh, try to affiliate with whatever associations they wish to. There's no obligation for those associations to take them in, uh, but they should be free to do so. And to suggest that they have to get the approval of their neighbors first before making such an affiliation, I think would be to relegate them to uh, an unacceptable second tier uh, status. Uh, so uh, those are just some thoughts about uh, the NATO aspect of this crisis. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, Ilya, I have a question I think I'll direct to you and there's a, a, a couple of questions and one that is increasingly <laughs> getting bumped up and it sort of relates to your, what you, the point you made around um, most Russian, you know, that, that Russian citizens are divided on this war. And I wondered if, if you can say more about that and 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 how um, how to make sense of those divisions and uh, what you think that means moving forward. Well, thank you, thank you. And by the way, first I wanted to thank Svetlana for the great diary. Uh, great time reading it just uh, recently. Uh, but um, yes, about that question, I wanted to address it. Um, uh, again, uh, I think the polls, the suggestions uh, of doing actual polling today in, in today's Russia, in its current state, under uh, you know a regime that could well be co called uh, severely authoritarian or totalitarian, under martial law, 
with all the new laws that are passed. Uh, if you ask a pe if you call up somebody and ask them in a poll, um, you, do, do you support the special operation? You may as well, as Masha Gessen has noted uh, last week, uh, ask them, uh, do you support a special, oper special operation that we're conducting? Or do you want to go to prison for 15 years? So in other words, the, it's not a fair question to ask people uh, it's by a stranger over the phone. Uh, and uh, I think the other thing I'd like to say is that uh, Russians today, as all of us all over the world, are living in a time of, you know, information war. Uh, in, uh, you know, uh, and even the person, if you, I think one of the big differences between, uh, I think, people in Ukraine today and, and people in Russia uh, to some other extent, is that uh, most intelligent people there understand that they're being lied to. I think many people in the West assume that they're getting the right picture. Uh, and the point is that there is an information war going on. And uh, obviously I, I point out, pointed out right away to my students. Uh, this is by the way, one of the ways I've coped with this is talking to my students a lot. I'm teaching Soviet history and we happen to end the, uh, the course uh, by talking uh, about 2014 and what happened uh, going into the Putin era. So it was very fortuitous. Uh, to talk about that and in, in, in my other classes as well, to talk about the war, um, mm -hmm. but uh, to be as open as possible about your own limitations. I think, uh, you know, we've made statements today uh, in some ways that we, you know, we derive from the media. We don't really know. I don't think anybody really knows what's in Putin's head, for example, uh, what moves him to do one way, go one way or another. But in terms of um, analyzing or looking at, you know, people's in Russia today opinion, uh, I think it's very difficult. I mean, everyone I, I, I'm speaking to uh, and I'm in contact with uh, it, it is in a real, con in a period of, of trauma uh, and a period of um, trying to process what's going on. Uh, and, it's, it, and it's not easy for them to, to process. Uh, so um, what I'm trying to say is that I think people are genuinely uh, confused uh, by the different messages they're getting. Uh, they understand, I think most people, that the government in, in Russia uh, is not giving them the full picture, certainly, if, if even part of the picture. Uh, but they also don't have complete trust in um, other sources as well. Uh, they're all very cautious about information in general. They're looking for uh, ulterior motives everywhere. So I think it's just very difficult to to judge uh, the reaction and the, and the level of, the other thing I would say is that having traveled, you know, not too long ago around Russia and in different places is that it's a very difficult to generalize about Russia, especially from the outside uh, in different regions, you know, very different Russias. And people are, when people are speaking in public uh, and people are say, sitting in private, they, they give you very different pictures about what they actually think. Uh, so I would be very cautious about any kind of generalizations. Uh, at the same time, I, I do want to say that um, just to, you know, uh, it's not clear what's going on in, in, in Putin's mind and how much uh, he's driven by that motive or this motive. His speeches in February were very, uh, uh, very layered. You know, he talked about uh, a lot about how Ukraine is not a real country and uh, all the stuff and and blame the Soviet Union, uh, all the Soviet leaders, and especially Lenin, for constructing it. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, he also did talked about how uh, how Ukraine is completely controlled from the outside. All these different things. Uh, it's not clear, I, I, and I don't think we can really we know what uh, what he's actually thinking uh, from the outside. It's very difficult unless we have really <laughs> amazing intelligence. So. Um, so yeah, I think it's just very difficult to make those kinds of generalizations about what uh, Russian people are thinking given the current uh, circumstances and the extreme freeze uh, and martial law essentially in Russia that is, uh, that is there. Um, yes. Thanks so if much, I can Ilya. add just a couple yeah. of uh, words to, to this, because I sure. was also very uh, interested in these um, <clears throat> uh, numbers. 
And from also what I hear from my Russian colleagues, sociologists, etc., there is one more aspect to what Ilya uh, just mentioned about this entire pressure and disinformation, etc. So they say like 80% or 75% or etc., cetera, etc., cetera, support Putin, but they do not say how many people refuse to participate in that, right? So 80% of what? Of 200 people? or 80% of what, we don't know, right? So it's kind of very difficult to say. So we hear, uh, of course, um, most people or many people, let's say, answer in the question in a particular way out of fear. Others refuse to answer or refuse to participate. And then we have statistics that, what, what does it reflect, right? So we also don't know, that's one thing. But then there is another thing, and that's about those people who indeed support, because again, unfortunately, there are many. And here we can also think about it from some kind of like psychologically, psychologically about what's going on, right? So imperialism is a very comfortable position, and it's shared by many people in Russia, uh, by many poor people unfortunately, and etc., because the only thing they can be proud of, as they are told, is the fact that they have big country. The bigger, the better. And this is the idea that has been promoted and propagated for many, many years. The fact that some parts of it are un completely undeveloped, nobody talks about that. But the bigger it is, the better. And this is kind of like one of the major things that many people accept it. And in a certain way that gives them some reason to sort of support another chance to enlarge that empire, et cetera, et cetera. And again, that uh, uh, kind of thing. But then at the same time, when some information is coming through in different ways about the atrocities, about the fact that it's not gonna be a small war, blitzkrieg, but might be a long war. Some analysts are saying today about two year war, right? So there are two options now, by my May 9 or two years, two futures. So, and people also kind of paralyzed or scared by this thought. And many of them are also in denial. In denial, and this kind of also like this psychological denial, right? So they would, they maybe even feel that something absolutely horrible is happening. But at this moment, they would just rather agree that this is a Hollywood uh, kind of staged scene rather than true. So it's a very interesting, again, psychologically speaking, how this certain twist and denial of reality is happening because we are speaking as even we are dealing with completely rational kind of situation, but it's not. There are so many complexes, fantasies, lacks of knowledge, uh, insertion of propaganda, et cetera. And that's what also part of cyber war. Cyber war is about psyops or psychological operations, right? So it works with fears, with desires, with complexes and other kind of things. And the denial is one of them. And so that's at least how I support some of the voices that I also hear from Russia. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I have a question for James. Um, a couple of the questions um, relate to your emphasis on refugees and, and the Russian strategy or, or least um, expectation that an influx in refugees would cause a, a reaction, a particular kind of reaction from the EU and how that has, has not actually gone uh, according to Russia's plan and how there's been actually such a, a positive um, international uh, response to um, Ukrainian refugees. And I guess one of the questions sort of relates to that, it, um, the how you see this, this um, international focus on Ukrainian refugees as galvanizing support and the potential for galvanizing support and, and how it maybe has forced um, uh, well, and maybe you could just say a little bit more about the difference in terms of the international response. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Syria, for example. If if you can uh, tell us uh, your, your uh, just a few more reflections on that on that different response. Yeah, it's 
the responses have been completely stark. So it's kind of understandable how Putin made that miscalculation in some ways, because you look, there's still the ongoing refugee crisis uh, from uh, Syria, millions of Syrians still living within Turkey. Uh, the EU, just before basically we end up having COVID, there was actually efforts by Erdogan to start pressuring Greece with regards to refugees. The EU response in several ways, I think to a large degree, we can speak to a certain degree of Eurocentrism when it comes down to it. Uh, you look at how basically the countries have, or have started to receive the populations, start to receive the people. It's been overwhelming support. That said, we have to kind of take that with a little bit of a grain of salt because we've seen with previous migration cases that initially there is an overwhelming support that ends up happening with regards to refugees. Uh, you look at Germany's response to refugees in 2015, initially Germany was very much in favor of doing what it could to support the uh, Syrian refugees. But as time starts to develop, as it starts to become more protracted long-term, opinions start to shift I'm not quite sure where we're going to be going with basically Europe in regards to, or in the EU with regards to the refugees. There may be a bit of a shift over time, but it's still uncertain. That's why I kind of mentioned during my kind of brief talk on it, that the strategy still could bear fruit for Putin because the longer the refugees are there, the more there's potential pressure upon the EU to reach some kind of resolution and put pressure upon Ukraine to perhaps reach an agreement that might not necessarily be in the favor of Ukraine with regards to Russia. Sorry, that makes sense? Yeah, thank you. So I'm gonna, I have um, a, another two-part question, which I always love two-part questions, and I'm sorry if it's, uh, those are difficult, but then you have the opportunity to choose which part of it you want to answer, if any. But I guess a couple of the questions that are coming up are really around, um, I, I, and one comes back to, again, uh, what Nicole had um, mentioned in setting the scene around how to think about a, a future. And I think, um, I, I think the audience, it, there seems to be some questions around, and this gets back to your point, Svetlana, too, around um, the increased push towards militarization as 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 this, as the as the option and and whether or not um, what what a peaceful resolution or a peaceful future looks like if you see that um, uh, what what seems to be a possibility uh, maybe I'll just leave that I'll leave that as the question because that was already a little bit wordy but I do think that. Uh, I really appreciated what you said, Svetlana, and, and your diary around your discussion around militarization. And, and I think it goes to Paul's um, comment as well around uh, how increasingly what we've seen is the list of solutions or even expressions of support have been around weapons, have been really militarized solutions. And so I'm curious about the space for um, discussions around disarmament, denuclearization, de and whether those um, conversations are harder to have and whether they seem um, unrealistic or, or if there's still space for, for thinking about a, a peaceful resolution. Well, maybe, should you Paul go first? Please. No, not through then. You could go first and I'll, I'll follow. Well, my uh, answer will be short, probably. Uh, as much as against, I was, but I do not see any solution now. We need military help. I cannot believe me two months ago would not believe that I'm saying this. But that is the situation, I think. And um, that's where we are. Myself, I've been supporting army with my own money, buying everything I could. So did everyone I know because 
we actually do not see enough help. And some parts, if you're following the development of our events at some points of our combat and our front, we are failing. Today and tomorrow, there were groups of our battalions who literally had nothing on their hands and had to go with bare hands against Russian army, right? So that's where we are. And we can debate pro or against sending weapon to Ukraine at this moment, but it's about us being killed or us pushing Russian army towards their border. And it's crazy that I have to say this, but at this moment, I do not even see what else can happen. Um, I wonder what Paul would say and others here. Well, I, now I, it feels like a complete deadlock. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't despair on this. I mean, the reality is, uh, very few conflicts actually conclude with uh, the complete victory of uh, one party or the other. <laughs> Almost uh, the great bulk of them end um, with some negotiated settlement. And uh, that's what I suspect will uh, happen uh, with the uh, current uh, crisis in, in, in Ukraine. Um, it's been, I think, uh, striking that uh, the government in Kiev has uh, signaled uh, from the beginning a willingness to talk to uh, Russia uh, with a view to uh, ending uh, its aggression uh, against Ukraine. Uh, and I think uh, we uh, should not uh, uh, give up on the diplomatic track. Uh, I would like to see maybe a little more energy on, on that uh, route uh, as well, while you know, recognizing that there's a clear interaction between uh, a relative military strength and the strength of the negotiating positions uh, at uh, an eventual uh, discussion. Uh, and so it's not uh, surprising, you know, that in a sense, you know, both sides would like to uh, strengthen their uh, uh, control of the battlefield in order to uh, strengthen uh, their diplomacy going into the talks. But I think uh, that, uh, is the path uh, forward ultimately. I would hope that it would uh, not be at the expense of the territorial integrity or political independence of, of, of Ukraine. Uh, uh, it uh, has already been, uh, I think, an important gesture in terms of um, the Ukrainian government uh, signaling that it, it uh, could support uh, a neutral, neutral status for Ukraine uh, going, uh, go going forward. Uh, so uh, it is not beyond the can of uh, uh, if the political will is there uh, for uh, a, uh, for a negotiated uh, maybe initially a ceasefire, but then you know eventually uh, a more comprehensive you know negotiated settlement that would have to deal with you know, the same sort of issues that the Minsk agreements, ill-fated as they might have been, also tried to to deal with, but. Uh, ideally in, in a more, more complete fashion. Thank you. Nicole, go ahead. Just, just to pick up on that, I, I agree. And I think Canada should be, you know, I mean, we're doing a lot in terms of humanitarian aid and military aid, but, you know, I would like to see, you know, more emphasis on once there is kind of, we get to the stage where there is a real ceasefire that can be trusted, right, on thinking creatively about what, kind of role beyond these that Canada can play in terms of negotiations, in terms of peacekeeping, especially maybe now thinking through already um, reconstruction and being in Ukraine, right, for the next many years um, to help out. And, and beyond that, you know, bigger questions are in terms of, of long-term strategic thinking in Canada and elsewhere, right? Next time that there is this kind of war, what kind of mix of of sanctions and tactics and so on are we going to you know, use? Because to be honest, even if Russia did pull out, the Russian army did pull out, right? And it stayed in Ukraine, 
right? You are sorry, it stayed in Belarus, for example. You just simply have new dividing lines, and you have other countries, right? Georgia, Moldova, and so on, that as I began with, right, have Russian military, but also want to move further towards the West. So we still haven't, you know, confronted this kind of big question about dividing lines um, that will continue, even if. And once we will, I believe Svetlana, you know, get to the point where, where this war, it might take a long time, but, but simmers down quite a bit. Yeah, go ahead, James. I think just a little bit of a follow-up to what Nicole said. I think the important thing, make sure when we do reach a peace agreement, one variety or another, the important thing is to make sure that it's uh, long-term and viable and can actually be sustainable. We see, for example, there's frequently a rush to kind of end the conflict, to end the tragedy, which there should be an end to the, tra the humanitarian tragedy. But at the same time, we need to make sure that the agreement provides the foundation for like long-term success and stability. We see the problems ongoing today with, for example, the Dayton Accords. The Dayton Accords were rushed in with Bosnia to rapidly end the conflict, but it really didn't address any of the issues. And we see some of the protracted problems starting to arise today. So we just need to make sure that the agreement is sustainable long term rather than just a rapid kind of end the conflict and then set up for future problems. Thanks for that point. Yeah, go ahead, Ilya. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, one is that, uh, yes, of course, we need uh, diplom diplomacy to end this uh, in some way. Um, what I think uh, I notice a lot of uh, uh, comments in the chat about NATO expansion and all this stuff, and clearly this is not something. Uh, it, it this uh, this is an important issue. You know, there's a, there's a great book that came out called "Not One Inch: America, Russia, and the Making of the Cold War Post Cold War Stalemate" uh, by M. E. Sarote. And this is a really good book about uh, just the documentation of how um, you know the, all the promises that were made uh, on all sides that were broken over time in terms of common security. There were many missed opportunities in terms of what uh, could and couldn't happen. There were indeed, you know, there was one time there was a partnership for peace, a partnership between NATO and Russia that was there, right? Uh, and those were important forums. Now, all that said, right, um, I was serious when I said that, you know, we don't know what is in Putin's mind. We don't know how much, what factors played in uh, to this decision. However, I would say that when this war was started in, in February and the build up to it, and uh, you know all these signals leading up to it, uh, I have to say that um, Putin's speech, long you know 52 minute speech that he made, and and then the the Security Council meeting, he basically be was a kind of a almost a, uh, a well, I think. To, to people watching this uh, and then seeing the war unfold and the speech that came out came two days later on, uh, on, on, as it unfolded on, on the February 24th. Um, it is, uh, you know, this was a, a, a way that, it, this was a war of choice that was made at that point. Uh, there were choices that could be made by the Russian leadership uh, and they chose to this most radical option. This was their choice. This was not something that NATO forced them to do. There was there was a lot of uh, talk, uh, a lot of people visiting Macron and others visiting Putin, trying to talk him out of this. Right. There was, that's why, like Svitlana, I actually thought this would not happen. That this was escalation, and despite all the evidence, uh, and uh, many people thought the same way. Uh, that uh, this this is just too maddening. It was almost seemed to me like suicidal from the Russian point of view to launch something like this. Um, that said, you know, in the, in the broad scheme of things, there is a lot of responsibility to go around for how things led up to that point. But uh, I think uh, some of the, the, the decisions that were made in February sort of swept all that aside. And uh, now we're dealing with a new reality uh, that we can't go back to those possibilities. We can't go back. All right. 
There's so many things, so many questions, so much more we could discuss. I just want to thank all of the panelists. Um, really, this was such a rich discussion and uh, obviously shows the depth of expertise that we have here at SFU. I really want to extend a special thanks to Svetlana, who's joining us from Ukraine. Um, all of the presentations were excellent, but I know it takes a, a different kind of effort for you and, and we really appreciate um, your contribution. We One of the questions we didn't get to, um, but we have compiled a very extensive list, was really a question around how people can help. I think there's a lot of audience members who are curious about ways to help. So we've, in the chat, compiled some links of ways you can support people in Ukraine. Um, and that will also be shared with the um, the recording of this um, presentation. So thank you, everyone. Uh, for for the, such a fantastic discussion. Thank you, um, SFU Public Square for hosting and all the technical support and all of the preparation that went into this event. Um, and uh, I really appreciate, um, I really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you to the audience for, for your great questions.